welcome to our service. Hello. Good morning. morning. Um, Yeah, I was going to say, welcome to any newcomers. You're very welcome. And please make yourself known to um, Ian or Jerry or the church office. If If you're new here, we welcome you here. And shall we stand and shall we pray for our service? Dear Lord, we thank you that we are gathered together in your name and we have come to worship you, Lord, and we just pray we may forget the cares of the week and problems of the day and as we come to worship you and bless you, as you bless us, Lord. And so we ask, O Holy Spirit, you'll be with us and very much part of this service and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and shout for joy, giving God the glory. God in Christ has revealed his glory. Come, let us worship. From the rising of the sun to its setting. The Lord's name is greatly to be praised. Give him praise, you servants of the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Reading from Luke 17. Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The kingdom of God does not come visibly, nor will people say, There it is, here it is because the kingdom of God is within you. Shall we sing our first song, Heaven is in my heart? Uh, We haven't done it for a while, but if you you don't know it, um, there's quite a complex and difficult refrain, Heaven is in my heart. So (laughs) I'm sure you'll get that part (laughs) and the depth of it. Yeah, Heaven is in my heart.
use the cross with every breath. The perfect life, the perfect death. You chose the cross. The crown of thorns you wore for us. The crown was with eternal life. You chose the cross.
lover of my soul. Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You put my feet upon the rock, and now I know. worship you with all our hearts until the very end. Lord, I think you've rescued all of us, or most of us from the miry clay in some form or other, Lord, and, and you keep doing it, Lord, and sometimes we're very, very deep. And Lord, yeah, we just pray, Lord, just pray for the lady who's fallen down at the moment, Lord, we just pray your peace upon her, your hand upon her. Lord, just be with her. Yes, this our Holy Spirit, Lord. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us for behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us, Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son, Father, forgive us, save us, and help us. Let us return to the Lord our God and call to mind our sins. We confess together as we pray. Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins, open our eyes to your truth, strengthen us to do your will, and give us the joy of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we pray, O oh God, your never-failing providence sets in order all things, both in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all hurtful things and give us those things which are best for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now, Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll fill us with your word, 
and that your word may take root and grow and blossom within us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I think today we'll remain seated for the reading of the word. So we'll have the first reading now. First reading is from Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 1 to 14. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the Queen Mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the craftsmen had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elasa, son of Shaphan, and to Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. This is the word of the Lord. We will read together Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing to the Lord of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Great is your power, that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praises of your name. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let rise up against him. Praise our God, all the peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. But you brought us to a place of abundance. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Here we have the Gospel reading now. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, Verses 11 to 19. Glory, Glory to, to Christ, Christ our Saviour. Now on his way to Jerusalem, 
Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where, where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise, praise to Christ our Lord. Would you bow your heads and let us pray? Oh Jesus, we thank you for your word. We pray that as we hear it, you'd speak into our hearts. Speaking into our hearts, you'd shape our lives. Shaping our lives, you'd grow your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please sit down. Val fainted and she is fine. Um, so... If anyone else wants to also lie down, there's a carpet over there. It will be more comfortable. Um, I was planning to look at the uh, Jeremiah reading, but then Luke overwhelmed me. And we'll, there'll be a tangential reference to Jeremiah um, in a few minutes. Let's see me I can find my actual sermon. The story you have of Jesus and the ten lepers is probably quite well known, and I'm quite sure that the majority of people, if it started the story and stopped it halfway through, would have been able to complete it and told us what was going on. So I thought, well, let's just have a look a little deeper at what we can see going on. We're told Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. He had set his face towards Jerusalem. Back in chapter 9, in 50, verse 51, we read, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So he wasn't heading to Jerusalem because there was a festival. He wasn't heading to, to Jerusalem because it was the capital city and there would be more people that could hear him. He was heading to Jerusalem to die, and he knew that, and that's why he was going. That was the whole point of his existence. That's what the incarnation was about. He came so that he might go to Jerusalem and that he might die. And as he's going along, we're told, um, back in chapter 9 again, he sent messengers ahead of him, and they went into the Samaritan villages to get things ready for him. He was heading from the north of the country, heading down south through various towns and villages, and the news about him was spreading. And then in the, the passage we come to today, um, he traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee, so it was partly um, a Jewish people, partly Samaritans, and he was going into a village. We're not told what the village was, where it was, the village itself is not important. It's about Jesus, not the place. It could be anywhere that Jesus was going. It could be here. And as he's heading into this village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out. Lepers in Jesus' day was Basically, anybody that had a skin complaint. They didn't have the science of today with the clear definitions we have. So there were various skin conditions that would have been termed leprosy back then. 
And if you had a skin condition like that, you were to separate yourself from the rest of the community. This was part of the laws of God. And we have found in the last three years how that works. When there is an infectious disease, the best thing you can do is to avoid contact. And when there are various diseases spreading, that's the, the most sensible thing people can do, is avoid having contact with people who are sick. But what it means is that the people that are sick end up being outcasts. And they are out of the community, they cannot worship, they are, in a sense, rejected. The Old Testament said they needed to wear rags and go along proclaiming themselves to be unclean so that they could be avoided. And as Jesus goes, there's, there's ten of them together. No doubt they had come together in their shared misfortune. And it's so often the case when people are suffering in some way Old divisions are overcome, and they find a new unity. We also need to recognize that sometimes when we see groups of people, it's not because they have an answer. It's sometimes because they've lost something, and people might well be united in their loss and their despair. And so if there's a whole lot of people who agree on something, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're right. And so these people, this group, sees Jesus. They've obviously heard who he is and what he has done in the past. And they stand at a distance and they call out and say, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They had a desperation. They needed someone to hear them. And they would stand and they would shout at Jesus. There was no polite asking, no deferential waiting for the silence so that they could make their request. They just shouted. And so often people in their need did that with Jesus. Back in chapter 10, we have the story of blind Bartimaeus. Uh, sorry, Mark chapter 10. And he hears, he's sitting outside the town, and he hears that this noise that they come to Jericho. And there's this large crowd, and at the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, was sitting at the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And in his case, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. And so often when we have issues, do we shout out? Do we have an insistent plea with God? Or do we ask politely and wait and just leave it? We need to shout out to God and cry out to him, as did these lepers. They shouted out to God because they had no one else who could help them. Lord Jesus, have pity on us. No doubt many other people had pity on them, but they needed more than pity. And one thinks of the people that Jesus heals over his ministry, and you have that woman with a flow of blood as Jesus is on his way to um, heal Jairus' daughter, and we're told she'd suffered for 12 years and spent all she had on doctors. She tried everything, and nothing could help her. No doubt these people were in the same boat. They'd done what they could. They tried what people had recommended. They put on the poultices and, and they'd stopped eating this and they'd given up chocolate and they had done whatever the, the common people say you need to do if you want to get well. And it hadn't worked. They were still leprous or they were still outcasts. And quite possibly people had got so used to them being leprous and outcasts that they just, that was their identity. And when you identify somebody as being like that, you often lose compassion for them. That's just who they are. And we don't feel as sorry for them now as we did a while back because 
That's just who they are. And we might not have leprosy. We might not have a 12-year flow of blood. We might not be blind. But we do have needs. And there are many needs that we have that no one else can help us with. And there are many people that have tried all sorts of things and it hasn't worked. And we need to call out to Jesus. And we know that as we say, Lord Jesus, have pity on us. He does have pity. Bartimaeus said, if you are willing, Jesus is willing. We need to call out. We need to be loud. We need to be insistent. Does loud insistence mark your prayers? And so often our prayers become, well, we just say the same thing and we, we'll mention things in our prayers and we get it done because we need to get it done. We pray because that's what we do. But how often are our prayers um, importunate, as I say, that we, we're calling on God, we're crying out and shouting at Jesus, have mercy on us. And Jesus looks at these 12 people and he says to them, Go and show yourself to the priest. He didn't always do that. Back in chapter 5, he healed another leper who'd come looking for help. And Luke records that when Jesus met that leper, he had compassion on him. Uh, and he said, where are we? Verse 13, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. He reached out and he touched the man. A little later in chapter 7, Jesus is heading into the town of Nain and he sees a funeral procession coming out. And the it is the funeral for a young man who has died and his mother has now lost everything. Her husband, she was a widow, and he was her only son. And he told Jesus, uh, said to her, don't cry. And then he went up and he touched the beer they were carrying and stopped them. In chapter 8, as Jesus is on his way to go and heal Jairus' daughter, a woman comes up, the woman, woman with a flow of blood comes up behind him and knows that if she can just touch him, she will be healed and she reaches out and she touches him and Jesus stops and he asks, who touched me? And she knew she'd been healed. And then Jesus goes into the home with Jairus and his wife and Peter, and he goes to the daughter. And we're told he took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. Jesus doesn't treat everybody the same way. Every single person is healed in a slightly different way. There's no one way of healing and one can imagine the lepers at some point down the line meeting up and over the tea and drinks in the evening, they find out, oh, you're a leper as well, but you're not you're in the group. What happened? Oh, it was this Jesus character. Were you also healed by Jesus? Oh, what did he do? Well, when he healed me, he reached out and he took me by the hand and he touched me and I was healed. And you? No, he just said to me, go and show yourself to the priest well, you didn't have as good a healing as I had. <laughs> you didn't get the full blessing. And our experiences of God are ours. And so often we want other people to experience what we've experienced, which is wonderful because we've had a wonderful experience. But sometimes we try and get people 
to have what we had. And if they haven't had what we had, they haven't quite got it. When I became a Christian, I can remember where I was and who was speaking. And they asked you to come forward. And I went forward at the end of the meeting and I prayed a prayer of commitment. And they prayed for me and I am saved and I'm a Christian. And what about you? Well, no, I, I just know I'm a Christian. You didn't get up and go forward? You didn't pray this prayer? Well, we're not sure about whether you are or not because you haven't had my experience. We cannot make other people have our experience. But likewise, we can't look at what other people have experienced and say, God, you haven't done for me what you should have because you haven't treated me like you treated that person. You didn't touch me. You just said, go and show yourself to the priests. That wasn't quite good enough. I want what they had. We need to remember that God knows exactly who you are and what you need and how you work and what is best for you and where you're going and what he's going to do with you in the rest of your life and for eternity. And he will do exactly what you need. Don't get confused by what other people need. And he says to them, go and show yourself to the priests. It was the law. They had to do this. Back in Leviticus, Moses brought the law of God and it says, the Lord said to Moses, these are the regulations for any diseased person at the time of their ceremonial cleansing when they are brought to the priest. The priest is to go outside the camp and examine them and determine whether they have been healed. And then there's a ritual they are to go through. Jesus doesn't circumvent scripture. He doesn't say to these lepers, it used to say that, but don't ignore that. And that's not so important anymore. Jesus' ministry and God's work aligns with scripture. God never works away from scripture. And that's always our measure. And I've heard people come with all sorts of harebrained schemes, which they believe God is calling them to. And it doesn't align with scripture. I've heard more than one person say, I actually believe God wants me to leave my spouse. No, he doesn't. Look at the Bible. Find out where God does that in the Bible and work with what the Bible says. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't right times to leave, get out of relationships. And there are so many abusive and destructive relationships. And yes, get out of them. And God does want you to have the best and to get away from destruction. But he doesn't want you to leave your spouse because that person has a, sort of a, a better Bible study or will help you with your ministry. God doesn't work that way. What he does always aligns with scripture. And as Jesus sends them to the priests, he's... He, they are healed, but he doesn't want them just to be physically well. He's looking for their wholeness. They have been excluded. They've been cut off. They've been outcasts for however many years it is. And they need to be declared clean officially in public by the system. This way, if they show themselves to the priest, he will say, yes, you are clean. They will offer a sacrifice and everyone will know. When they go into the market, people, oh, that's the one, yes, that's happened. It's not just them saying, well, actually, I'm clean now. Why are we not, not so sure about that? God wants complete wholeness for people. He wants people to be restored, not just physically, but completely. He wants them reintegrated into society. And they went. Why did they go? How many? <laughs> Stand there. Just go and show yourself to the priest. Now, I've got leprosy. I need to be healed. Then I'll go and show myself to the priest. But they went. And they didn't stop and say, actually, if I go and show myself to the priest, this is a bit stupid. I've got leprosy. This is a waste of time. Doesn't make sense. This doesn't fit with the way I think it should work. 
They went and showed themselves to the priest. Why? Because Jesus told them to. They went despite their situation. And we need to do the same. When God tells us to do things, we need to trust and obey. That God is telling us to do what is right. And we do it because he says so. Not because it works or makes sense or fits or anything like that. When God says, do this, we need to do it. And as they go, they are healed. And the one man comes back. And we told one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He didn't come back to thank Jesus. Well, he did, but that's not, he didn't come back thanking Jesus. He didn't come back with a thankful spirit. He didn't come back uh, thankful for the wisdom or the guidance or anything. He was praising God. He recognized that what Jesus had said was God working. Here was this person who was able to identify this itinerant preacher come healer with God. And today it's, it's self-evident because we know that Jesus is the Son of God. He is one with the Father. He's part of the Trinity. That's our understanding. At that time, they didn't have that. Jesus was just another bloke and a bit of a troublemaker if you listen to certain people. And he was walking about getting dusty and dirty like everybody else did. And he was hungry and thirsty and had to go to bed at night. He was just another chap. And this guy says to you, go show yourself to the priest and you're healed. And you realize that is God. What about the other nine? As I was preparing this, I stopped and thought, I cannot make sense of the other nine. <laughs> what was going through their heads? What happened? They clearly were all healed, and only one of them came back. Was it possibly a formalism? They, 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 they let formalism overcome their passion. They wanted to do the right thing. They were in this formal, you have to do all the right things, and you're going to show yourself to the priest, and that's more important than turning back and giving praise. And so often we get caught up in a formalism that, that it limits our um, natural full response and we do not worship because we're caught up in the formal or maybe they ended up with another explanation which is what people do today as they were going along they said well there's a coincidence um, look I'm getting better actually I was feeling quite well this morning I think I was getting better already it wasn't Jesus. It was there's some other explanation for it. I prayed to Jesus that I would be healed. And I prayed for three days and I went to the doctor. And the doctor identified what was the problem and he gave me medicine and so I got well. Um, so therefore I don't actually have to go back and thank Jesus because there's another explanation. We need to thank God for everything that happens. Whatever the explanation, recognizing that God is behind even the doctors and the medicines and the resetting of your arm. God is behind everything and we can praise him for it. And then they note this chap that comes back and he was a Samaritan. Whereas Jesus asked, was the nun returned to give praise to God except this foreigner, this outsider? And one of the things that Luke does in his gospel is he highlights how this good news is good news for everybody. And he has lots of stories of people that shouldn't have received the good news getting the good news right from the beginning. You think of this, the story that Luke has of the, the birth. It's the shepherds in the field get brought down, those outcasts that have nothing they are brought in. This is a gospel for everyone. Luke himself was an outsider. He was probably Greek. And he's highlighting how Jesus ministers to outsiders, not just to the Jews, to everyone. Who do we exclude? 
Who do we think God can't work with that person or he'll work with us? Um, maybe those Dutch Reformed people across there, maybe God doesn't work so well with them as he does with us. Um, and if they really wanted an experience of God, they need to come to us. Or maybe if you really want an experience of God, you better stop coming to us and go to rivers or wherever. We, we're very good at trying to define and exclude people. And when do you feel excluded? Do you think that, that there's some way that God cuts you off or, or you're outside of it? And it could be any kind of reasons that, that we feel, well, I'm not quite good enough, I haven't quite measured up, I haven't quite made the grade, I did this and I shouldn't have. Whatever it is, that we, we, the devil comes so often and says to us, well, actually, you're the Samaritan, you're outside, you don't really belong. You're second rate. Nobody is outside ever with God. And Jesus says to the Samaritan, rise and go, your faith has made you well. And as he says, your faith has made you well, it's a, it's a broader uh, phrase and just has restored your health, has taken away your leprosy. Your faith has made you well. It's translated in the old King James, it was, your faith has made thee whole. Some other translations have it, your faith has saved you. It's not just a physical restoration, it's a complete and ultimate and absolute being made completely well and whole with God. That's what the incarnation is about. Jesus came to save. He didn't just come to teach. He didn't come as an example. He came to meet our biggest need, that we might be reconciled with God. He came and set his face to the cross that he might bear our sins and give us his life. And he has done that. And that is the grounds of our greatest thanks. This Samaritan turns and comes back to give thanks to God, to praise God, to say thank you. What do you come back to God to say thank you for? What is there that God has done for you that you would give thanks for? You need to give thanks each day. You also need to, moving into the notices, think of it for next week when we come to the St. Luke's Day. I'm going to ask people to bring something as a, as a symbol of their thankfulness. To be able to lay it on the altar and say, God, I thank you for what you have done, for what you have given, for what I've received, for the way you have worked. And every single person will have something different that they're thankful for. But we'll bring it to God and say, God, we thank you. So begin thinking of that. Where is our thanks? Let us pray. Oh, Jesus, thank you that you meet our every need. And very often we don't even know what our needs are and you can meet them. Oh Jesus, thank you that no one is excluded, irrespective of what the world may say, irrespective of the thoughts we might have ourselves. No one is excluded. Thank you, Jesus, that you are our saviour, that you have come to make us whole. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us continue praying. Let us take a few moments in silence to dwell on the words of Ian and his teaching. Let us continue in intercessory prayer. Lord God, our Father in heaven, 
We thank you for this time of new life as we see green leaves appearing, colorful blossoms, the heavenly fragrance of the spring flowers, <clears throat> and the rejoicing of nature as a whole. This is just one part of your amazing creation. We marvel too at the great diversity of living organisms that only you could create. Some are so small that they're not even visible to the naked eye. Yet they are fully functional and suited to the environment and the part they play in the integrity of your creation. Dear Abba Father, we pray that you will help us too to understand our real purpose in your universe. Dear Father God, we pray that you will help us to be disciples in our own way and help to guide those who are distracted from your splendor by the work of Satan. In, in the words of Jeremiah 29 verse 8, do not let the words of prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. We pray we should always be thankful to you, our Heavenly Father, for all your blessings that you pour on us with more love and grace than we deserve. Let us be motivated by the one leper of ten that Jesus healed and give thanks to praise you each and every day. We pray, dear Lord, for healing and rebuilding in this broken world. We pray that the greed of man should give way to non-selfish administration in all world leaders, community and business leaders, and leaders that influence the daily lives of all citizens. We pray for all that have lost loved ones, belongings, livelihood, as a result of the pandemic and the ongoing wars and natural disasters. We pray too for the sick, that your hand will bring healing as needed. Also that they may be encouraged by the Holy Spirit to maintain faith, to maintain faith even under the most devastating circumstances. So too for the homeless, the orphans, widows, senior citizens with inadequate support, prisoners and all suffering from maltreatment and abuse. We give thanks for the leadership of Archbishop Taba, Bishop Steve in our diocese, and for our clergy, Ian, Jerry, and Jeanette. Please, Lord, continue to bless and inspire them. Please hear our prayers in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Why don't you stand as we share the peace? And just recognizing that each one of us has a need, <clears throat> excuse me, which we may not be presenting to others, but we would love God to do something about. As you turn to the person next to you, say to them, may God's peace be with you and heal you today. May God's peace be with you and heal you today. Please. Thank you. I was, wait, I was waiting for the also with you <laughs> and with you. <laughs> yes. <coughs> okay. Show all your grace, help us to serve you in truth with Christ's face. Grant us your mercy and help us to love that others may know you as Lord from above. Oh Lord, help us along. Oh, 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 oh. 
so we move into what is known as the great thanksgiving. And we say, God, our generous Father, has given us all that we have and enjoy. All things come from you, and of your own do we give you. With this bread that we bring, we shall remember Jesus. With this wine that we bring, we shall remember Jesus. Bread for his body, wine for his blood. Gifts from God to this table we bring. We shall remember Jesus. The Lord is here. The Spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Oh, it is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. And on the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. Father, do this in the remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. And at the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in the remembrance of me. Father, do this in the remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. And as we proclaim his death, and celebrate his rising in glory. Send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And now, with your whole church throughout the world, we offer you the sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. And now won't you sit as we pray together our Lord's Prayer. And being the prayer that he taught us, it's the prayer that he longs to fulfill. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to deceive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. And so in body and in mind, in spirit and in heart, draw near and receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. And 
can I remind you to stand, if you would, on the right-hand side of your chairs so that we may pass more freely in front of you. Are you going with them?
Son of God and fold you with His Spirit and His love. Let Him fill your heart and satisfy your soul. Oh, let Him have we give thanks to the Lord, for he is indeed gracious. His mercy endures forever. God, our Father, you have reminded us again of the coming and sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Confirm our faith and fix our eyes on him until the day dawns and Christ the morning star rises in our hearts. To him we glory both now and forever. Amen. And as we face out into a new week and new things happening all around us, we ask God to use us in the same way but in new ways too as we meet these challenges and the needs of the people. And we have a lot to offer because God is with us and his spirit is in us. And God goes before us into this world and is waiting to work in us and through us. So, Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory and in us, and through us, and around us. God, bless Africa. Guard our children, guide our leaders, and give us peace for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And in years to come, when people thank God for what he has done in this continent, may we be able to say, yes, and we were there. And we were playing. And now Ian has some notices for us. I said that in faith, of course. <laughs> <laughs> A few quick notices. I think probably the most important one is that it is Jean Bieber's birthday. Happy birthday to you, Jean. <laughs> Roger, can we sing? Happy birthday. I'm sure we can. Happy birthday. <laughs> some slightly less important notices. St. Luke's Day is on the 18th 
of October, which is next week, Tuesday. We will be celebrating it next Sunday. We're going to have a service in the garden. So if you're praying for rain, please stop. <laughs> uh, We will have things set up as we have the last couple of years, and we trust that it will be a great blessing. And as I was saying earlier, bring something that represents an aspect of your thankfulness. I'm sure that all of us have got a huge amount that we're thankful for, and we look at our lives and have all sorts of things that we are thankful for. But find one thing that you're particularly thankful for, and find something that will symbolize that, that you can come and put on the altar saying thank you to God. And so... Be judicious as well. I am particularly thankful for my family and my wonderful wife. And I have a wedding ring, which is a perfect symbol. And it would fit on the altar nicely, but I probably would never see it again. <laughs> so it would not be what I would need to put on the altar. So be aware that whatever you lay down, you may not get back. We, we're not saying you won't, but don't be surprised if you never see it again. Um, and it can be anything. If you're thankful for gardens, bring a leaf. If you're thankful that you can read, bring a book which we can then donate to someone else. If you're thankful for your career, bring some aspect that would represent that. If you're thankful for the music you play, you can bring a plectrum or something to put on the altar. Just something that will be a part of our offering of thanks to God for what he has done and is doing. We'll be in the garden at 9 o'clock. Do come. And for those that haven't yet come back to church, do consider joining us next week for this celebration as well. And bring friends. It's always a wonderful service. And I believe that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. And uh, probably the most important, a plate of eats that we can have a bring and share tea afterwards. Thank you. But don't put them on the altar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stand. Father, there is so much to give thanks for, and we thank you for this moment in time when you've allowed us to gather together on a beautiful morning. Well done, Val. That's lovely. And we thank you for Val who's been here and has learned and enjoyed the service from a new dimension. <laughs> <laughs> We're not starting a new fashion. <laughs> but there is so much to be thankful and grateful for. And we thank God also that we live in a world where we can make a difference. And we live in a world that not only needs God, but there is a God. And always hang on to that. And in the middle of the night, when it's overwhelming, startle the neighbors by shouting out to God, come and save us. So go into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Fight the good fight of faith, that you may finish your course with joy. And now the blessing the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit move amongst you now, settle upon you and settle into you. Give you the stillness of the early creation and the wonder and the beauty of the light and the life and the love that is God. And may this peace remain with you and in you and flow from you every day and every moment of every day in the week that lies ahead. Amen. Amen. If you'd like some prayer, there's prayers in the corner and there's
tea and coffee and stuff outside. But before you do, we have a song. Thank you, Zaja. Should we sing our closing song, Jabulani? to trust and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you all. God bless you.